Last week, we kind of started the journey, the fear factor, the importance of faith in the daily life. So let's kind of review again about how important faith is. So would you join me and read from Hebrews 11, part of that verse says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then Paul says in Romans 14, whatever is not from faith is sin. Kind of get the idea that faith is really, really important in the Christian life. As a matter of fact, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Last week we talked about, it's amazing how many things in the Bible that we're supposed to be doing all the time. So you get, a, you get the idea that all these things are very, very closely connected together. Again, the Bible says without faith, got to have faith in everything we do. If it doesn't come from faith, it it's sin. The Bible says we're to be moment by moment being filled and controlled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible said we should be rejoicing always, that we should be praying without ceasing. The Bible says in everything give thanks. The Bible says day and night we're to meditate on the Word. Again, how can we be doing all these things all day long unless they are literally very connected together, and I think they are. And so I've asked Bill to come down. I had Bill dressed in a white gown today, so how many of you saw Bill earlier? How many of you thought that's strange? All right. Anyway, you might see some strange things around here, all right? So he kind of represents the Holy Spirit. And by the way, just to remind you, if you remember about heaven, the Bible says we're going to be decked out in white robes. So kind of get used to it. Maybe we need to have a white out Sunday where we all come dressed in white, all right? Kind of get used to what it's going to look like in heaven, all right? So I know I, 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 I do it on a cool day. So he's, he was back there kind of sweating. So anyway, if you ever see somebody in a white robe, avoid them on Sunday. They're probably giving you something. They're helping you participate. But I appreciate Bill. He's a good brother. So, you know, again, all these things are connected. I want you to understand that walking by faith, and I think walking in the Spirit, being joyful, praying without ceasing, they're all connected. And so as a believer, you have two options. I want you to always know that every day you get up, you have two options. You either walk in the Spirit, and I believe that's kind of walking side by side with the Spirit, or you walk after the flesh. And so walking after the flesh, as I see it, is kind of me walking ahead of the Holy Spirit. Even though he's on board, even though I have him in my life, I'm kind of living life by what I see, what I feel, what I hear. And this is what the Bible calls walking after the flesh. And the Bible also refers to it as a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian, in my opinion, is not just getting drunk and chasing women, that would count. But a carnal Christian is just really living the Christian life in your own strength. And I just want, if I, I wish I could tell you that every day I get up and man, I'm walking with the Spirit, I'm depending on the Spirit. But I too often get up and I find myself overwhelmed with life. And the reason I get overwhelmed is because I'm walking ahead of God and everything is bigger than I am. And so I, I get kind of worried and stressed. How many of you ever have known a Christian that got worried or stressed? Now, not us, of course. We're full of faith. We love Jesus. We're always smiling on Sunday. Everybody give me your Sunday smile. You know, we all look good. But you know, the reality is that sometimes I find myself stressed out. I find myself worried and struggling. And when I'm doing that, I'm just merely walking ahead of God and I'm, I'm taking life on myself and I get stressed. And so I always got to remember that all, all the problems that are bigger than me but none of them are bigger than God. And so if I learn to walk in the Spirit, no matter what we face, if I can see life from heaven's perspective, even though I don't understand, I, I'm going to know that it's going to be okay, that I can relax, because even though it's bigger than me, again, it's, it's not bigger than God. All right? And so one of the verses we referred to last week, but I want to give it to you this week, and you can fill in the blank if you do have notes. Would you read with me out of Romans 12, verse 3? Paul says, For I say to you through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. And so I want to give you some good news today. 
I want to give you some really good news. There's nothing going on in your life that a miracle won't take care of. And for most of us, that's what it's going to take. And the good news is God has given to each of us a measure of faith. Can I tell you again, as I mentioned last week, there's nothing you're facing in your life that God has not already given you a measure of faith. And so you're either seeing your life from your perspective and you're going to be really overwhelmed Are you seeing life through the eyes of God? And even though you don't understand, you know that this is not the final chapter. And you can know that that it's going to be okay, that God has everything under control. And so this morning, Bill passed out some glasses. If you got some glasses from Bill, if you'll come forward. Anybody here? All right. You got a wide variety of people. That's good. That's good. Just come and kind of stand alongside of Bill there. The fact that Bill passed out the glasses is just a reminder that faith comes. We mentioned that last week. Faith is not something we muster up. Faith is something that God gives us. How many of you know that God already knows what you're going to face this week? He already knows. So he already provides the faith before you ever have to face anything. And so these glasses kind of represent faith, all right? And so up there on the cross is, again, kind of those big glasses that kind of remind us of God's view of life, that God sees life differently. And so they all have been given a measure of faith, all right? And so here we have faith down on the end of the nose. And so even though he has faith, sometimes he looks over that and doesn't really tap into it, all right? His faith is stuck on his shirt here, even though he has it. And over here, we're holding faith. Those are nice-looking glasses, by the way. And so some of them are holding faith, Uh, James' faith here is up on his head. How many of you know that doesn't do you any good if you're trying to look through that? And so, again, another faith up on the head. We're getting close over here. This is my hero right here, all right? (laughs) Who would have ever dreamed, man, that you would be in church wearing those weird glasses? I (laughs) I wouldn't have, man. All right. And so this is kind of where we want to be. You know, all of us are facing things in our life But wouldn't it be great every day, honestly, if we could get up and if these glasses kind of represent seeing our life from a heavenly perspective, this is where we want to be. We want to see life and all the craziness because, again, it is crazy out there. But we want to see life as God sees it. That's walking by faith. It's it's helping us see life from from heaven's perspective. So anyway, I appreciate your boldness. You guys are amazing. (laughs) And so again, I appreciate it. Let's give them a hand. You all can put your glasses in here. So if you see a guy walking around in a white robe on Sunday morning, avoid him at all costs. All right. Or me, the same way, avoid me. All right, let's read our our, uh, dictionary type definition of faith in the Bible. Again, this is out of the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible gives you various meanings of a particular word, so it's a little bit longer, but it helps us to understand the verse, all right? Let's read out of Hebrews 11.1. Will you join me? Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So again, faith isn't based on what I see or feel or hear. That's walking after the flesh, and that's going to cause a lot of stress, all right? And so my definition of faith is faith is seeing and understanding life from God's perspective. Again, if we could think about seeing every day through those, the lens of God and knowing that, hey, it's going to be okay. How many of you know God's not up in heaven chewing his fingernails and stressed out? How many of you know everything is under control? And as we walk with God, we begin to sense, even though I don't understand it, 
I know God has everything under control, and so I can relax. I can enjoy the journey, even though I don't understand it, all right? And so let me give you an example. Moses, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, by faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. You say, how did, how did Moses endure? How did he make it in life? The Bible says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He kept his eyes on the Lord, not on what he could see in the natural realm. He was one of the great leaders, and the Bible tells us he endured by faith, by walking and keeping his eyes on the Lord. Corey Tim Boom says this, and Corey Tim Boom went through a lot during the Holocaust, but she said this, a great quote. She didn't use the word faith. But I think that's what she meant when she said this. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. How many of you know that's true? If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at God, you'll be at rest. I think she was talking about a life of faith, keeping our eyes on the Lord, and we'll learn to rest along the journey. And this morning, I want to talk about the connection between faith and the spoken word. And there is a connection. Again, there are many things in the Bible that are interconnected. And one of those is the spoken word and faith. And if I listen to you talk very long, I can probably tell you something about your faith in the Lord. If you listen to me very much, you could tell me something about my faith in the Lord. Listen to Hebrews 11 verse 3. Would you join me? By faith we understand, and by the way, faith is not only seeing, but understanding. That's part of my definition. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by what? The Word of God. You know, you don't have to prove to me creation. You don't have to prove creation. The Bible says, by faith, I understand that this world was spoken into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God literally spoke this world into existence, the power of the spoken word. And by faith, we understand that. So that the things which are seen were not made out of things which are visible. This world was created by the power of the spoken word. And so the centurion in, in uh, Matthew chapter 8, and we want to turn there, let's read together how the centurion understood the power of the spoken word. And by the way, he's one of only two people in the Gospels that Jesus ever commended for having great faith. Isn't it kind of sad that for all the Jewish people who studied the word and knew the word, that none of them had even good faith. I mean, most of the time, Jesus was surprised of how little faith they had or no faith. But one of two people that he commended for having great faith was a Roman centurion. The other was a Syrophoenician woman. Both of them were Gentiles, which is kind of interesting. But let's turn to Matthew chapter 8 and let's read this story and see the connection between faith and the spoken word. All right. Matthew 8, verse 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus says, I will come and heal him, which I would be excited about. But verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Can I tell you how amazing that is? He understood that if Jesus said it, it was done. Everything Jesus spoke happened. Can you imagine how, how crazy that would be? Because, you know, they say we speak 25,000 words a day on average. Now, some of you raise that average. Some of you lower that average. But 25,000 words a day. Can, have you ever thought about that every single thing Jesus uttered, boom, it happened? You know, if he got mad and kicked his car and said something, poof, it would gone. I mean, he had to watch every word he spoke. And so the centurion said to him this, you don't have to actually come 
All you have to do is speak the word. And then he explains in verse 9, For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. Another, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Listen to how Jesus responded, verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. There's not many times that Jesus marvels, and when he does... Have your spiritual antenna up. I want to find out what made Jesus marvel. He says he marveled and he said to those who followed, verse 10, Assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great what? Such great faith in all of Israel. Why did he have great faith? Because he understood that Jesus didn't have to actually be there. He understood the connection between faith and the spoken word. That if God says it, it's a done deal. You can bank it. It's going to happen. And so Jesus marveled when the Roman centurion understood the power of the spoken word. And then in Mark 11, the cursing of the fig tree. If you have your Bible, flip over to Mark 11. Again, to illustrate the power of the spoken word. Mark 11, verse 12. Now on the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, talking about Jesus, and seeing afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. But when he came, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And I like how the end of verse 14 says, his disciples heard him say that word, those words to the fig tree. Now, understand when this fig tree, and by the way, it says Jesus responded to the fig tree. One translation says he answered the fig tree. How many of you have ever talked to the fig trees in your yard? All right, not, we wouldn't admit it on Sunday, but he, he answered the fig tree. Now, for him to answer the fig tree, that tells me the fig tree said something to him. Have you ever wondered what the fig tree said to him, that he would answer the fig tree? Here's what I think the fig tree was saying. The fig tree had lots of leaves, and he went to see if he could find fruit. But the Bible clearly says it wasn't the season for figs. And so I asked myself, why would he curse the fig tree if we're clearly told it wasn't the season for figs? Doesn't seem to make sense. Until I read and studied that back in that day, whenever the fig tree had leaves, it also bore figs. So from afar, he saw all those leaves. And so that tree was making a profession. I've got fruit. I've got fruit. I've got fruit. And so because of all the leaves, he came because, again, with trees that had leaves also had figs, but this tree had no fruit. And let me say this. I think the immediate application was to the nation of Israel that had all the leaves of religion, but they had no fruit. But the Bible says he cursed. Later, Peter says, you curse the fig tree. But the word curse there, when we hear the word curse, we think of foul language, and that is cursing. But really, the word curse means to speak evil against someone or something. So when he cursed the fig tree, all he said was a negative sentence, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Now, when Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, what were the chances that fig tree was going to bear figs? Because the power of the spoken word. And the Bible says the disciples heard him say that. And so let's look down on the next day when they come back by and they see the fig tree dried up. Look down in verse 20 of Mark 11. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. He was surprised. And he was expecting Jesus to be surprised. He wasn't making the connection between faith and the spoken word. And so when Jesus cursed the fig tree, again, Jesus, or Peter was surprised that the fig tree had withered away. And listen to what Jesus says in verse 22. He answered and said to him, have faith in what? In God. Let me, important thing, and we're going to talk more about this next week. The Bible never says, have faith in faith. How many of you remember Norman Vincent Peale? 
He was kind of a positive type speaker, positive motivation. And uh, of course, you ought to be old probably to remember him. That's probably why I remember him. But anyway, Norman Vincent Peale came up with this saying that I heard around the churches. And he used to, he had this saying, have faith in faith. Have faith in faith. And that sounded pretty cool. I haven't heard people quoting it, have faith in faith. But can I tell you, the Bible never says have faith in faith. That's telling me that your faith is on how big your faith is and not in God. But the Bible says, have faith in God. It's not how big your faith is, it's how big your God is. That's why, again, next week we're going to look at this a little more closely. But, you know, almost everybody who came to Jesus, as we mentioned last week, and we're going to see next week, almost everyone that came to Jesus came with an imperfect faith. As a matter of fact, the disciples usually came with itty-bitty faith or no faith. I mean, they struggled with this thing, the entire ministry of Jesus. They struggled. He was often saying over and over, why is it that you have no faith? Why do you have just this little faith? They struggled. And we too can struggle, again, if we walk after our own understanding. And so he says, have faith in God. And I want to tell you, regardless of how much faith God has given you, it's not how big your faith is, but it's where you place your faith. You know, I love how Spurgeon said, even a trembling hand can receive a golden gift. It's not how big your faith is, but if you'll go to God with what little faith you have, I believe God will often honor that. I mean, I see that in Scripture, and we'll talk about it next week. And then he says this. After he says, have faith in God, then he makes some application for them. He says in verse 23, As surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. So not only did he have power cursing the fig tree, but he said to those who were following, I tell you, if you'll speak to this mountain, if you'll talk to this mountain and say to this mountain, be removed, you can have whatever you say, the power of the spoken word. Now, let me say this. It would be kind of interesting, and we're not going to do it, but it would be kind of interesting to see how many people here today at some point in their life tried to go out and move a mountain. Or even a little hill out in the backyard. Hill, move over there in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to give you my opinion right here because I can. I'm up here. I don't think Jesus was talking about a physical mountain. Could God move a mountain? Absolutely. No big deal. But you know, moving a mountain is not really going to help you in your life. There's no evidence anywhere in Scripture where people went out and they rearranged the landscape. There's no evidence in early church history that they went out moving mountain ranges. Not one example. What was he talking about when he's talking about moving those mountains in your life? Well, studying Jewish culture, mountains often represented barriers between where God's people were and where they needed to be. Does it surprise you that if you look at the Old Testament, the children of Israel were always facing some kind of mountain or some kind of a giant? Why didn't God let the giants live across the world and let us just be in peace? Have you ever wondered why every time God wanted his people to be somewhere, there was always a mountain, there was always a giant? Because he did not want the people to live one day in their own strength. Every day they had to depend on God. Every day they had to know that those giants and those mountains were bigger than them, but they weren't bigger than God. How many of you know that as you get older, you still have to to, to face giants and face mountains? I wish that when you turn 60, God said, that's enough mountains for you. Just cruise on into eternity. (laughs) Woo! Because I turned 60 this fall, I'd be excited. (laughs) Some of you younger pups, you have to wait. But how many of you know, I look out and see some white hair. How many of you know, no matter how old you get, there's always a mountain, always a giant. 
Why is that so? Because God never wants you to do it on your own. Every day, you got to depend on God every day. And you know what I found? That when I get through this mountain, you know what's on the other side? Another dead burn mountain. So I said, oh, if I could just get through this, if I could just get through this. Yeah, well, you got another mountain coming, another giant. I remember sitting with a lady in her mid-90s, just broken about all the stuff going on in her life. You know, you never get to a point. There's always mountains, always giants. I don't think he was talking about physical mountains. Here's what I think he was talking about. I'm giving you my spin. These are the mountains that I struggle with. If we were to go around today, probably all of us here are facing something that's bigger than we are. Facing giants in our life, of our job, relationships, something about the future, money, health, doubt, family, sin. You say, how, how, do, we, how do we get by? How many of you know if you ignore the mountain, it's not going to go away? How many of you know if you come back next week, it's still there? I used to pray, God. Get rid of that mountain. God, sick that, I'm going to sick you on that mountain. God didn't say that. God said, you got to talk to those mountains. you got to understand the connection between the spoken word and faith. If you believe God is bigger than that mountain, you got to talk to that mountain. You guys are quiet. Some of y'all are holding on to your pew. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody say, all we can do is just hold on until Jesus comes? Well, hang on. God bless you. Hold on. But if you don't mind, some of us would actually like to move forward. Wouldn't you be like to know as a giant killer and a mountain claimer other than just somebody that just sat back and died of stress? There's another one just died of stress. Just couldn't take all the pressure. It was just overwhelming. It always is. So how do we deal with mountains? Got to talk to them. How many of you have talked to those mountains in your life? And in Jesus' name, you know the power of the spoken word. When you're walking in the spirit, your words have clout. Now, if you go with, without God, just say, in my name, I command you to leave. They're not worried. That's why the Bible says we pray in the name of Jesus. The Bible says his name is good in heaven, on earth, under the earth. It's like a cosmic credit card. It's good in three worlds. <laughs> That's why when you quit praying at the end of your prayer, you don't say, in my name, in the name of the Baptist. The devil says, <laughs> But when you come in Jesus' name, I don't care if you've had a bad day or not, he hasn't. That's why we got to walk with the Spirit, man. We're walking in faith. And when you're walking in the Spirit, walking in faith, every word you speak has some clout. You got to talk to those mountains. You got to remove those mountains through the power of the spoken word. He illustrated it by cursing a fig tree, which is no big deal. But he said the mountains in your life are much bigger. How many of you know I don't have any more clout than you do? You know, once you finally get it, you're going to understand we don't even need the preacher. I can do this thing on my own. Me and the Lord can do it. But I don't want you to get that just yet because I want you to want me around. <laughs> so how do we deal with the mountains? We got to talk to them. We got to learn to speak to mountains. How many of you are kind of excited about charging those mountains? Some of you say, I'm just hoping it goes away. I'm just hoping it goes away. <laughs> hang on there, man. Hang on. Jesus is coming. Hang, hang on. But there's a few of us here that I think are getting it. And if, even if you're not getting it, always not. I think you're getting it, and I, and I move faster. <laughs> if I don't think you're getting it, I back up and give you another illustration. So we, we want to move on. You say, how do we release our words? How do we begin to speak with mountains? Uh, where, where do we start? I'll tell you where you start is in prayer. Listen to what he says. 
It's neat how all this fits together so beautifully. I, I wish I could make it up. It's just right here for us. So verse 22, he says, have faith in God. Verse 23, he tells us to speak to those mountains in our life. Verse 24 starts off with therefore. Whenever you see a therefore, you need to find out why it's therefore. Every therefore or wherefore is making an application to what's just been said. So he just got done saying, have faith in God, speak to those mountains. And so therefore, as a result of everything we've said, that whatever things you ask when you pray, you got to ask, got to say it, you got to speak it. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You say, well, where do we begin to release this faith? It's in your prayer life. It's in your prayer life. When you quit asking God to take care of it and you just begin to walk with God and speak to those mountains, I mean, it's in your prayer life that you release those spoken words of faith. And so now you're kind of, how many of you are excited to get to your prayer closet and begin to move mountains? You say, can anything stop us? Can anything stop us? Well, yeah, there is one thing. By the way, Jesus says that while you're excited about moving mountains and going to prayer and asking God for anything, and don't you love these prayer promises that whatsoever you ask in prayer, there are always those big promises. You know why they're big promises? Because we serve a big God. When you're praying Polly want a cracker prayers, you're probably praying in your own name. So I said, oh, I don't want to overtax God. Don't worry. He's good. So you say, well, can anything hinder us in our prayer life? He goes on. It, it, all of this just connects together so beautifully, all right? So, therefore, verse 24, whatever you ask when you pray, believe it, you receive it, you'll have it. Verse 25, by the way, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, you better forgive so that your Father may also forgive you. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Isn't it amazing how all this connects together? You mean if I'm going to move mountains, I got to be right with you guys? Yeah, yeah. Ah, that means we got to be right with each other. We got to put our faith in God. We go to the Lord in prayer. We got to learn to be mountain movers. Or we're going to literally die of stress. So the connection between faith and the spoken word is pretty cool. The thing, it's universal application. It's good for all of us. What faith you have. And by the way, can I just make this observation? I used to pray, God, give me bigger faith. Give me bigger faith. And, and I do want bigger faith. But here's, can I, just, can I just tell you my thoughts? God will give your faith in proportion to, to the mountain in your life. So if you're praying for great faith, you know what you're praying for? A big mountain. So now I'm saying, God, I'm cool with little faith. God, I'm cool. Just help me use what little faith I got, and I'll deal with this little anthill. I'm good. Let Leon have the mountain. I'll take the molehill. I'm good. I'm just saying, why would God give you big faith if you don't need it? Be careful what you pray for, right? If you're praying for great faith, strap it on. You're going to need it. But whatever faith God gives you, he's big enough. Let's pray. I know there's not any of us here today that's exempt from mountains and struggles and, and, and giants. If we were to go around, I think we'd be surprised at the heartache. The fact that you're here today is the grace of God. I just want to give you, again, some good news. If we walk by faith, if we'll walk in the Spirit and begin to speak to those mountains in prayer, I want to be a mountain mover. I want to keep moving forward with God. And every little mountain we cross gives us faith to handle the next mountain. 